Hello and welcome to Miss Hannah Loves Grammar. In this video we'll be concentrating on the overarching themes and ideas of La Belle Dame Sans Merci, a ballad by John Keats. Keats has earned his place as a much-loved English romantic poet and he's well established within our canon of literature. He was a second generation romantic so that means that he looked to others before him, like Wordsworth, Coleridge and Shelley, and loved their views on progressive belief that love should take a precedent over the ritual of marriage in and of itself. He was very aware of the power of nature and loved the idea that one should be drawn by emotion and intuition over just merely doing the right thing by one person. The major ambition I would see within his own poetic work, though, was also to bring about a revival of the medieval genre. And that's even intentionally drawn out by the fact this is called a ballad. As a young man, though, he lost him, both his parents to illness. And perhaps this coloured his decision to then go to medical school. And he qualified for medical school and began to sit his exams to be a doctor. Unfortunately, though, the same illness that wiped out his parents and his siblings killed him aged 25. That disease at the time was tuberculosis. Now, within this specific poem, we have an anonymous questioner talking to a knight who is dying in front of him. And he's dying due to the dangerous powers of a mesmerising woman. There is something more to be said about what this title can give us as a clue into what this mesmerising woman is all about. So, La Belle Dame Sans Merci, as many of you may know, translates from the French as the beautiful woman without pity. Perhaps it's the fact this is in French, but to me it, it creates an allusion to the image we now call of the femme fatale, the dangerous woman who does not care who she hurts as long as she gets what she desires. Now, the really clear signal that he wants to revive the medieval genre is clear by the intentionality of saying the form of this poem. It is a ballad. He's explicit with the readership so that we understand with due credence what he's trying to do as a poet. But we're clear, this is a dangerous woman who's responsible for this night dying. In light of this poem having 12 stanzas, it makes most sense to pour over each stanza at a time. So I'll read each stanza and as I go through, I will unpick the major findings within it. Oh, what can ail thee, knight at arms, alone and palely loitering? The sedge has withered from the lake and no birds sing. Instantly our speaker poses the question, what's wrong with you knight at arms? And it's as if we as the reader are unpicking the symptoms of this knight and his suffering. He is alone, he's pale and he cannot move, that's why he's loitering. But beside that he is amongst this landscape which is dying. The sedge is withered. And the fact that we seem to be submerged in this bleak and wintry location seems pathetic fallacy for the impending doom of this night about to die. As if that weren't clear enough, there is no sound from nature. Even the birds aren't singing. Oh, what can ail thee, knight at arms, so haggard and so woebegone? The squirrel's granary is full and the harvest's done. So once more we have a repetition of the first stanza's question from our speaker. They really want to know what's going on. Why are you in this position? But additionally, the terse language, which is abrupt, abrupt and sparse, it adds to the pain of this knight at arms. He's haggard and woebegone. Once more, the repetition of ale. But as if that weren't bad enough, there's a juxtaposition. Well, the squirrel, his granary is full. He's done his work before he goes into hibernation, well, before the harvest's in, he's, he's, he's got what he needs. So you've got the squirrel that has everything it needs, yet here we have a knight suffering at the mercy of, well, we don't know yet. By the third stanza, our speaker is really worried at the symptoms of the illness that 
the night has. I see a lily on thy brow, with anguish moist and fever dew, and on thy cheeks the fading rose fast withereth too. The urgency of this fading rose fast withereth, the repetition of the F sound in the alliteration, and across that stanza we've also got fever dew, it really accentuates how close to death the knight looks. He's like a fading rose. He looks like he's very close to the end. But more than anything, the symptoms he has are sweat pouring off his face, a fever, anxiety shown on his face. The use of negative imagery from our speaker of what he sees in this bleak, wintry scene of a knight dying near him is a very nice contrast to what we hear in following stanzas from the knight himself. I met a lady in the meads, full beautiful, a fairy's child. Her hair was long, her foot was light, and her eyes were wild. Here, what a marked contrast it is. From negativity, we move to enchanting imagery. And by enchanting, what we really see is due diligence and intensity. This woman ticks all the boxes. She's beautiful. She seems erotically attractive, fascinating, and even deadly with her wild eyes. The direct reference, the mythological reference to her as a fairy's child, is clear. It's as if he's been under a spell. But more than anything, it juxtaposes the opening three stanzas that we read, where death seemed to take precedent over the imagery of life. We now get into the depths of exactly how he was charmed by her, but also what he did for her. I made a garland for her head and bracelets too and fragrant zone. She looked at me as she did love and made sweet moan. So here we have the gifts that he has given her. A garland, a bracelet, a perfume. The question is, was he enchanted to do this by her being a fairy's child? Or did he want to impress her of his own choice in this way? The most alarm bell moment that we encounter so far in this poem is she looked at me as she did love. She never said she loved him, she just looked like she did. So my question is, did he dream that? Do we know that for a fact? Seems like a very unstable truth to extend such attention. Yet, if that weren't enough to suggest that this was a very intense and passionate uh, fascination, he then says, and made sweet moan. Now, there's passion hinted at here. It's as if there's a sexual climax that's alluded to. Now, to what extent this is truth, we don't know. But he seems as if he's still on this spell of enchantment. I set her on my passing steed and nothing else saw all day long. For sidelong would she bend and sing a fairy's song. So here the intensity of his affection is heightened once more. It's as if he's blinded by love and nothing else saw all day long. And she seems enchanting because she bends, she sings, she has this really intense fairy song. To me she is intense and dangerous to bewitch him in such a way. But the, the mythical image of her as well singing a fairy song to me, it echoes the view. He is intoxicated with his fascination of this deadly woman. That said, it makes absolute sense that he would be dying. He might be intoxicated by his love. She found me roots of relish sweet and honey wild and manna dew and sure in language strange, she said. I love the true. So the knight recalls what the woman gives him. She delights him with things that seem to be mentioned in the Bible. The honey that's wild, the manna that's due. This is an Old Testament um, set of wonderful delights given to biblical characters. And these seem like natural uh, delights 
here harking back to romanticist ideas of what love could look like, the offering of nature. I'm alarmed though once more that it's said in a language strange, I love thee true. The fact that the language seems strange definitely makes us apprehensive as readers. It seems negative. Maybe it's just me, but as a reader, we're questioning to what extent is this knight wishful thinking that she said she loved him true? She might have got him some food, but does it say she loved him? As if that weren't enough, it's as if we're reliving some sort of paranoid recount here. She took me to her elfin grot, and there she wept and sighed full sore, and there I shut her wild, wild eyes with kisses for. Wow. In this stanza, it's an emotional and sensual engagement. He shuts her wild, wild eyes with kisses for. But she weeps, she sighs, she's engaged with her senses, and the knight supports her with kisses. That's his comfort for her. We're questioning though, why is, she, why is she crying? What's so upsetting for her? And I think Keats is quite intentional about his use of repetition and assonance. She's enchanting through her wild, wild eyes. It's very emotive and sensual. And there she lulled me asleep. And there I dreamed, ah, <gasps> oh, woe betide. The latest dream I ever dreamt on the cold hill side. As if this weren't enough, the exclamation marks across this stanza signal how passionately he can recount what happened. To what extent they are based on truth, we do not know. But the use of dashes as well really adds to this. Actually, I believe they're hyphens, but it adds a lot to the sense of disrupted um, thought and intensive recollection. The repetition of dream across this stanza adds to our concern. Is this just an illusion or is it based on some genuine reality? Not a dream, but a moment in time. As if that weren't enough, he's lulled asleep by her. He has a bad dream and he's on the cold hillside. Hmm. So the reality seems to me, he's on a cold hillside. Not quite the dream he'd had before. I saw pale kings and princes too. Pale warriors, death pale, were they all. They cried, la belle dame sans merci, hath thee in her thrall. The repetition of pale in this stanza serves two purposes. It's the absence of colour, it's all turning grey, it's all turning brutal, but they're also linked to visions of, the, of others. It's almost hallucinatory and it's almost ghost-like the use of the pale. So this is almost a dreamlike sequence, okay, you've got apparitions telling him that the lover has him in her thrall. Others who've been had had this treatment from this woman are explaining to him the depths of despair that he is in. Interesting. Dangerous. Once more, it's further proof this is a dangerous woman. The knight seems powerless like all the others that are at her mercy. It seems unfair to put it in simple terms like this, but this is very clear from Keats. He's at the mercy of a dangerous, dark, mysterious woman. I saw their starved lips in the gloom, with horrid warning gaped wide, and I awoke and found me here on the cold hill's side. It's quite grotesque imagery actually. The infatuation is now pain. These others that he sees have starved lips, their horrid warning is really clear to him. As if that wasn't enough though, the repetition of cold hillside makes the reality ever more painful. The first person narrative by this stage in our hearing the night in action is powerful. It's so personal. I awoke. I saw. I sojourn as we read on later. 
it adds more than he was telling me a story about how his lips were, you know, like those of others before. It's it's much more dynamic, much more evocative. By the last stanza, though, we meet a near repetition of the opening stanza. It's almost cyclical, and it adds to how unfortunate his fate is. And this is why I sojourn here, alone and palely loitering, though the sedge is withered from the lake and no birds sing. Keats uses the ballad form, though, for two reasons. Ballads often had a cyclical element, and it accentuates, in this case, how sorry we feel for the night. But it also illustrates the truth of love. Ballads were used as love forms in poetry. And so let's think about that in a structural sense. You'll see that I've annotated here in the final stanza how it is for every single um, stanza. A, B, C, B is the, the ballad rhyme. And it's iambic tetrameter. It's eight syllables per line with four stresses on lines one and three of each stanza and three stresses on lines two and four, which adds to this abrupt ending that we feel and no birds sing. I think the structure and the rhyme scheme heighten the eerie tone of this poem, which seems abrupt, melancholic and desperate. And I think as part of that, the fact that this is a ballad and harking back to medieval times adds something different too. So medieval times, people were enchanted um, by stories that were spoken. And so rhyme that was clear and kept the meaning clearly by simple language was easy to be remembered and then easy to be retold by somebody else. Keats uses that style to his own devices and creates a masterpiece that, well, whilst it was written hundreds of years after the medieval form began, still draws to the intensity of passion and infatuation, and to some extent, hallucinatory desire. <laughs>